bottles of Ritzina, a great meal, and I agreed to do it. And then it was like, well, now, a director actually said to me once, it became code, if I would go up for a film and I would meet with the director or to, or to read with the director, he would say, I really loved you and my cousin Minnie. It was code for no way am I going to hire you. So then in the mid-90s, I got a bunch of Hollywood films all together, but they were all basically people I'd worked with before, like Jonathan Lynn. I made three more movies. He, I, he, I was in three more movies of his. Uh-huh. And uh, but they they none of them the, 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 a couple of them at least were very good, but they weren't didn't become the craze that my cousin Vinny became. That was huge, yeah. And and uh, but it was the la- it it was the uh, you're saying that was the drop off yeah, after that you yeah. And then I did one for Barbara Streisand, but but she and I had worked together before. Oh well, much. and and I, I knew that. Whoopi Goldberg very well, so <laughs> mm-hmm. we. So it's almost like my friends got me some films in the mid '90s, and then, in terms of Hollywood movies, that was it, except mm. for A Beautiful Mind. But but Ron Howard had been interested in having me in a movie since an audition I'd done for him before my cousin Benny, mm-hmm. and none of these and, and and A Beautiful Mind, of course, won the Oscar. I mean, it was a sure. success, but it. It um, it didn't dispel. Was the uh, the Barbara Streisand was that nuts or something? That, that was the mirror has two faces. The mirror has two faces. Uh-huh. Okay, I, I should know her. this. I love her. I love her, and the and uh, the um, um, and the one with Whoopi was actually going to be a big hit, and then it wasn't. It's a good movie called The Associate. Oh, I remember that with Whoopi Goldberg and 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 Diane Weist and. Mm-hmm. That was going to be a huge hit. It was doing very well with audiences in previews, and then it didn't get very good reviews, and then it just kind of faded away. Yeah. And um, so um, uh, there hasn't been a counterweight against my cousin Vinny, even a, the beautiful, a beautiful mind. Mm-hmm. People say, "No, we just we want more of that, my cousin Vinny." Right. And it's like. It's, so and where would you have taken the role had uh, you known that it was going to... I mean, I guess that's a stupid question. I mean, given that the pop... It's, at one point, though, it'd be, people know you and they came up to you on the street all the time. A new generation, I guess. Yeah, my based cousin, on my cousin almost Vinny. always my cousin Vinny. It is. Uh, occasionally Oz, the TV series, and occasionally oh, right. course, Doc, yeah. the first one I did with Barbara. Barbara, of course. And, uh, but my cousin Vinny is still... Busy. And that movie never goes away. It's like having been in, you know, one of the great Hollywood classics of all time. And I thought it was a very funny comedy and smart. And I mean, when I read the script, I thought, but I, I thought it would be kind of a cult film. Mm-hmm. Not mainstream. Oh, yeah. I thought it would have a following and mm-hmm. people would like it. It would be one of those eccentric film comedies. That, but it touched, some, I, mean, I mean, the movie as a whole touched some nerve in mm-hmm. the national. And of course, it's a very well made movie and everybody in it is good. And it, um, um, uh, but I have a feeling it really threw a monkey wrench. Mm-hmm. Oh, but other actors have had this experience, like the hit you didn't want to have, mm-hmm. <laughs> because then people just want that. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure, it's like a variation on typecasting it's a uh, yeah it's not even a variation on it they 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 create the type then when when they really like a given performance right and then when since everybody in the industry knew that i had gradually in my adulthood outgrown a stammer and learned to control it as an actor that that meant all those times i wasn't being authentic yeah which is not but you had uh not a nice thing to say but i wonder if uh, (laughs) If you speak fluently, it's not the real you. But this was also in tandem, this this phenomenon that you're describing of being typecast, of mm-hmm. getting that of, mm-hmm. of, of, from my cousin Vinny. And by the way, I noticed that I had not turned on my recorder, but we got the my cousin Vinny parted. I missed some of our political conversation, though, but it's okay. Well, <laughs> I'm going to come back to it a little bit. Okay. When we do, if we do get back to politics, ask me about an article in the New Yorker the week after the election, when, which I'm quoted. Oh, is that true? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I will ask.
it, the, it, My Cousin Vinny came out in 80... What year? It came out in 92. Oh, 92. Okay, so it's well after the change of the industry. But it, it, there was like the, the, the age of the corporate Hollywood film yeah. was, was well... Well, along yeah, I guess, it was. But, but... It, it was really in all every level. It was it. It was a maverick, actually, which is true of all those films I just mentioned mm-hmm. that I made in the mid nineties. They were all kind of maverick, personal, like the mirror has two faces, uh-huh. and um, um, they associ- They they were eccentric scripts. Mm-hmm. They were um, all of Jonathan's movies, the the great one. Um, of the ones of his I made after my cousin Vinny were was Trial and Error. Have you ever seen that? I don't know that I have. Oh, that's a good movie. Jeff Daniels and um, I guess it's a courtroom. And not a courtroom yeah, film. I play the judge. That film has some marvelous things in it, mm-hmm. and it's be- and um, that marvelous woman who won the Oscar um, in Trial and Error, but she won the Oscar for another film. She won for another film. Yeah. Um, in the in uh, Charlene Therzon, is oh, it? she's wonderful, and um, <clears throat> Chef Dan. And, so, and so Rick, what, what it, Rick Torn is oh, wow. phenomenal. In yeah, it. the lead is Michael Richards. You know, who's yeah. on Seinfeld. Sure, sure. It's a very good movie. Yeah, right, very smart. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, very yeah. good. So if that had been the hit, I would have worked for years off of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh well. Does this weigh on you? Not really. I mean, I'm going on and on about it, but mm-hmm. but no, no, not really. Well, we'll talk plenty, so you know it will be only a small part of the conversation. No, it, but it's, it's, you do bring uh, it up. It, I mean, it's like I don't walk around obsessed with it. I've made a lot of indie films since then. I know you have, and some of which are available to be seen, and others not. Sure. Yeah, um, and um, um, and I've acted a lot in the theater and, and I mean I'm it's not like it yeah. just um, well I noticed a couple of things I want to say one thing that bothered mm-hmm. me a little bit I was saw this documentary these young guys made about you I thought it was a beautiful homage to you and you know well deserved did you, you see the the 20 minute version yes I saw both there's an hour long hour and 20 minutes I saw that one too you I saw that I contacted see with what I do I just find the filmmaker they're usually on Facebook or something. Yeah. I just write them and they, they send me a link. Yeah. Because they see my body of work that I've done or yeah. the people that I brought yeah. on, you know? Yeah. And so they sent me first the short and then I'm like, isn't there a feature version? And then they sent me that. The only part I wanted to talk to you about, and, and not for long, of course, but is that a couple of times, I th- it was almost like you were self conscious about having done these indie films. So you were sort of saying, and I know it was in a joking manner, but it was like, uh, uh, you know, nobody will ever see them, that kind of, you know. And I'm thinking, but, you know, these independent films, they're, they're so grateful. Like the guy, that my friend who made The Mend, which you were a, oh, a yeah. supporting character. I in. love that movie. Yeah, John. John. Uh, I love that movie. Yeah. And, and did you ever and, see one and, called Bad City? I don't know if I saw that the, one. The lead in it is played by an African-American guy who was on um, The Wire. The Wire. And, um, I may have seen it. And, I, and um, I've it's had got, almost everybody from the wire on the show too. It has a marvelous cast. I, I play the yeah. bad guy, uh-huh. and it, it. The guy sent me the script that, um, the writer director, mm-hmm. and um, I was halfway through reading it, and he called me, and he said, "Well, I, what, I, you know, you." Re-, I said, "Oh, I'm in the middle of reading it." He said, "Well, what?" Do you, I said, "I can't figure out what part you want me for." And he told me, I said, I, I'll take it without even finish. It was so out of my normal yeah, range so totally that you're, or, or that you're offered. Yeah. But of course, you want to play the villain. I mean, if it's well written anyway. Oh, right. those are the best. Sure. But the exact kind of person he was, was mm-hmm. I'd ne- even apart from being the villain, because mm-hmm. I'd played villains before in movies, but he's so hideously together. Mm-hmm. It's like. Um, so yeah, there's the role that usually goes to Kevin Spacey. <laughs> kind of, yeah. You know, he's always so um, yeah. And Kevin, I think, would yearn for the kind of parts that I get. Yeah, could probably do them because well. right, most of the things he's offered were, had been yeah. or have been, depending, yeah. Depending who you talk to, uh, usually the 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 villain. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know. Well, anyway, I was just remarking that in that one, I think John M- 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 McGarry. M- I'm trying to remember his last name. The guy who did the the mend. 
Oh, and yeah. and, and uh, Mickey it. Sumner is in it. Who is uh, they? He did the podcast with Mickey Sumner. Who, oh yeah, yeah. Who is you know, of course, Sting's daughter. Yeah, She's yeah. She's an actor, a very fine actor. Yeah, lovely person. So I just noticed in the documentary uh, about you, which I don't know people can find. That's going to be a little harder. Most of your doc- independent films, even though people don't know how to sort through and navigate which films to see, because you know it's a guess for most people. They 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 don't know. There's not the kind of marketing and advertising like yeah. a Hollywood movie gets. I didn't when I so said that. I didn't for... mean movies like The Mend. No. Oh, okay. Or or Bad City, which has been. Right. You can only you, you you have to look for it, but it can be seen. Mm-hmm. But do you do them like because you, you you do some of the independent films because you feel oh uh, here's an earnest, young, talented guy. I do or them maybe if, a former student. I do them if I like the script. Okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it should be based on that, right? Yeah. But then you show up and it's uh, no trailer. No, I'm kidding. But you know, it's like uh, beyond. It's like well. You know, and then they—I don't know if some of those experiences are really out there. I mean, some of the, these guys are real pro, or real pros, even though they—they're working with a very low budget, but they're still. I've real never pros. worked on one where the one of those indies where the director didn't seem to know what he or she was oh, that's doing. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so I just made one last week, mm-hmm. and the, the woman who directed it really knew what she was doing, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I, I don't think I've ever worked in a movie where I thought this director is clueless mm-hmm. ever in the theater. Sometimes I have. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Not very often, but sometimes. Mm-hmm. Is that your phone or mine? It's One not. Phones it's not mine. I may, at least, okay. Yeah. I might have left this. Is the film work just to keep you sharp? Is it to, it's your skills? Is it just to because it's in? Just I like enjoyable. to act. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny. You're an actor. So. <laughs> it's more fun. It's more... All, but I do a lot of theater. Mm, right. Part of the reason I do a lot of theater, first of all, I like to act. But also, as you get older, you want to keep exercising the, the muscle of learning lines, which is not as big a challenge in film because you don't ever have to play the whole script in a film at one time. Sure. You take it scene by scene. But in play, you have to... Yeah. When you're in performance, you play the whole thing. And so I like to take parts, uh, and particularly if it's a part in the theater, that, and this can be anything, a showcase or a fuller production than that or whatever, uh, where I, I have a lot of lines to learn because I like to keep exercising that, that muscle. Mm-hmm. And um, a, few, a few years ago, when I was way too old for it, I got in that play by David, David Mamet called Oleana. Oh, sure. If you can learn that, you can learn anything. I mean, it's such intricate writing. It's brilliantly written. Right. And But it's, it's just intricately written. Oh, my God. And a year and a half ago, I played King Lear I, I, in Long Island City um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, with a really interesting director and cast and everything. And, and, and No, I'm just... Uh, yeah. yeah. And a year <laughs> ago right now, uh-huh. or a little... Over a year, right next door, I played a a new play called The Workshop, which again had was a very long role, and that was sort of down to the wire. Mm-hmm. Those were very hard lines to learn, but um, I, do we keep going? I would have wanted the part anyway, but because um, <clears throat> it's a great role. But I also was was drawn to the challenge of learning the lines. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. of course. Of course they to... and, and it's like, because I know a lot of actors who want to keep acting when they get older, and they, mm-hmm. and they say, but I wait for the right part, I wait for the right circumstances, and then they, they're out of practice in learning lines. So I'm, I get, yeah. because I'm almost 80, <laughs> It's remarkable. You look great. Thank you. I mean, that's a backhanded compliment. Cause no, it's no, like, no. Make, no. When I get that, it's usually, wow, you don't look 55. It's like, So you're saying is you're old. You just yeah. don't look old. <laughs> yeah, but right. make no mistake, yeah. you're old. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's exactly. the way I interpreted it. Exactly. But maybe I'll get over that hump yeah. and stop I, worrying uh, about it. I get a little alarmed when I go through security at airlines. And they said, oh, you don't have to take off your shoes. 
<laughs> I said, what do you mean? Yeah, what do exactly. you mean? Yeah, exactly. Well, 75, you, you don't have to take off your shoes. Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> That's an insult. And I get snarl it's, at them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, so so you you're, you the main thing is to obviously yes, it's like working out, like going to the gym or something where you need to do it regularly and consistently, yeah. so that way you don't get flabby. Totally, in this totally. case, brain flabby. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And the day will come when it will be very hard for me to learn lines. Well, you've put it off a long time. It doesn't look like it's coming up. I mean, you, yeah. I just saw you do a, a play next door called "The War of the Roses," which you oh adapted. yeah, because yeah. you, you know I, I understand that you. You you've been uh, one of your hobbies is improving Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I think this is the second time you've done this, right? Where you've combined two Shakespeare plays, or is this just a re, even a re, uh, a new version of? Did like, I, wasn't did, there R th- like H six R three or something? Was that the same combination? That's that's the same. It's the same combination. It's just a new title. Or wasn't? That oh, you a, mean years ago? Mm-hmm. Didn't you have like a version of this? I fooled with it, but but I uh, see. but it never was, got produced. Oh, okay, okay. And and um, um, but this guy who played Richard, whose whose name is Matt mm-hmm. Matt de Rogatis, um, he uh, he came to me. He said, "I want to play Richard the Third. Will you direct it?" And I'd played Richard the Third twice, uh, some years ago, mm-hmm. maybe six or seven years apart. And I remember being struck when, when those productions happened, and they were they were both under the showcase code. They were good productions, but the audience keeps hearing about this stuff that happened, and they don't know what it is. Mm. And and it's like um, because it picks up when Pretty Rutland was killed, you know, the little boy or whatever. And they don't know what they're talking about. So the audience goes, just waits for the key scenes in Richard III because the other scenes, they simply don't know what it's people are talking about. It's historical exposition in some yeah. sense, right? Or no, but it's, it's even more problematical than that. It's passing references. And they, with the people are clearly agitated about. And the audience has no idea what they're talking about. Now, in the original production of Richard III, they would have seen Henry VI Part III just, just a few months before. Right. Oh, so because at the Globe or wherever. Well, yeah, in the original production, they yeah. would, it would have been right. Uh, they would. That's it was amazing. like see, seeing the Godfather Part Four. Everybody knows it, these were sequels almost. What the, happened the, before? The, the, yeah, the, the history plays. So I said to Matt, "I'll only do this mm-hmm. with you," and I was only going to direct it then. Um, that if we can put it together with key scenes in Henry the Sixth Part Three, mm-hmm. and um, and he said, "Okay." And I said, that's going to be good for you, too, because you get to, to Matt, I said, because you get to see the origins of Richard. He didn't start out evil. Mm-hmm. And, and um, um, you see how, he, how that sort of develops. Yeah. And, and um, um, the first person he actually murders on his own is King Henry. And then I kept offering King Henry to an actor friend of mine who kept saying, oh, I'm, I'm, not up to, I'm not up for it. I don't, he wasn't feeling well and all that. And I, So finally, well into the rehearsal period, I took that part myself. Because I thought in case that actor changed his mind and wanted back in, I could step aside. Oh, I see. And, um, you couldn't ask that of but a, I couldn't another do actor. That. I couldn't go to another actor and right. say, oh, no, this first actor wants to yeah, do it now, right. so you're out. Yeah, that didn't work for me in the dating pool either, dating scene. <laughs> I tried that. <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, I try. Yeah. Yeah, but I enjoyed that. Actually, I was really, like, it, got, I was, it did kind of all start coalescing, and I'm not, like, you know, and I, I think it's uh, not, Also, the point not seeing a lot of that of sh- long scene with Queen Elizabeth at the end of the show mm-hmm. where... He he tries to get her on his side after mm-hmm. he's murdered her two little boys, <laughs> and in the play, when you see Henry the Sixth Part Three, you see the scene where she first meets his brother Edward, mm-hmm. and you see that she's a canny operator. Mm-hmm. She's a political person. Mm-hmm. So the meaning of that scene in Richard III is he's counting on that. Okay, I murdered your two sons, but I'm striking a deal with you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to marry your daughter, and she just won't give in. And that's maybe the longest two character scene in Shakespeare. Oh yeah. And the point of it is the he just gets unhinged because he's counting on her to 
come on, well, let's yeah. deal politically. Yeah. And she won't back down. That's how it's done, right? Yeah. 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 And, and th- that's why it's such a brilliant scene. But out of the context of how you first meet her in Henry VI, Part Three, the scene doesn't mean as much. Mm-hmm. But you see her move from this p- politically canny woman who says, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm too mean to be your queen and yet too good to be your concubine. And he, she's effectively saying, you marry me and, and we'll talk. Mm-hmm. And that way I'll be queen. Mm-hmm. And Richard overhears that and he goes, wow, this woman is sharp. Mm-hmm. And he's counting on that mm-hmm. at the end of Richard III. And she, she won't back down. And he starts to go, he starts to unravel before. Really? Yeah. yeah. And the meaning of that is, starts in Henry the Sixth part. So there are all kinds of things. That, right. There are in, they're all kind of connections and, yeah. and that you can see yeah. if you're familiar with all the, the... And the arc of the whole thing is a set of brilliant character studies. And it, and it, and it, it, uh, the, and, and Richard the Third is only the, the last part of the character studies. Yeah. For a lot of those characters. So in the historical plays, Shakespeare's historical plays, it was there's uh, the three Henry parts of fifth, Henry the Sixth. But there's right, okay. But there's also Henry the Fifth, right? which was written a lot later. Okay. But Henry the Sixth, Part One, Two, and Three, and then Richard the Third is effectively Henry the Sixth, Part Four. Although Henry the Sixth has oh. already has just been murdered. I see. And uh, when he murders Henry the Sixth. That's the first time he actually kills anybody on his own, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it, it sets something loose in him, mm-hmm. right? And and um, uh, so that's all valuable knowledge for yeah. watching Richard the Third. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tried a similar. It was a whole different script, but I tried it oh, t- ten, fifteen years ago. But then we never put it on. I see. We did a reading of it, and Peter Block, who was my co-director on this. He directed that a reading of it where Queen Margaret was Lynn Redgrave and I was Richard and and um, it was pretty good, but then it never resulted in a production. I see. Um, but the, are the do you like the historical plays more than other categories of Shakespeare? Or, or have you read everything all Shakespeare? I've plays? read them all. Right. Have you and you performed a healthy number of them? I assume. What? And you, I'm, I assume you've also either acted or directed a healthy, I've a healthy played percentage of that. Hamlet. I've played Richard III twice. I've played Richard II. I've played Shylock. I've played King Lear twice. Mm-hmm. First time I wasn't very good. Well, I'll tell you what happened in that. That that was in, in that was in Boston. Eighteen years ago, or something, and I, I, I opened to deservedly bad reviews. I just wasn't re- wasn't ready for the part. And um, then, about halfway through the run, we we had two days, three days off. It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we resumed on Wednesday night. So I went out to to San Diego because they were doing my play called Orson's Shadow. Oh, sure, yeah, and. Um, it was the first production after the original Chicago production, but before the New York production. So I really wanted to see it. And they, fl- they flew me out. So I went out there and I did some drugs while I was out there that made me high. And then I flew back on the Wednesday and I mm-hmm. thought, well, I'll, I'll be myself again when for the Wednesday night show. And I, I, we landed in Boston, and I thought, I'm still high. Clearly, I, this wasn't pot. <laughs> no, it was, was a, not was pot. Was it psychedelic it or something? Was not, it wasn't psychedelic either. Okay. It was one of those things that makes you like high. Okay. And I, I thought, what am I going to do? And the stage manager was this very nice young woman who clearly didn't think I was very good in it. Uh-huh. She never explicitly said that, but... She came back at the intermission on this Wednesday night and said, "What happened? This is incredible. <laughs> you're 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 so much more leer like." Okay. And I I thought, "Holy shit." Uh uh <laughs> and I told the other guys in the dressing room. I said, "Uh 
I was high tonight. They said, no kidding. <laughs> oh, they knew. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. eyeballs. Oh, eyeballs, you know, yeah, your dilated and, pupils. And just my general, and... it was a whole new performance. Yeah. So I thought, and so I said, do it, do it. Do any of you guys know any dealers? And every, and everybody laughed. I, thought, I can't keep doing this. Right. Uh, so I thought, okay, I've got to remember what it was I did tonight. And I, what I did was because of the condition I was in, I just eliminated all the transitions. What does that mean? It means I would go from being calm to being in a rage without any. Oh transition like an actor building up uh, or, or right and right, yeah. that put me square in Lear territory oh okay in other words yeah and so I thought okay from the rest of the run I'm just going to eliminate all the transitions and in fact the director came a couple of nights Brilliant. later and said god if we had oh this performance would have gotten raves yeah I mean he wasn't angry at me or anything he said right wow yeah only years later did I tell him but it's it's what a great lesson I mean you took this you know, crazy uh, instance that happened, yeah. and was were you were able to learn from it yeah. and apply well, it? I mean, it was taught to me. I yeah. mean, I, I I wasn't right. Uh, I was suddenly being told I was very good, and indeed, responses of people who saw it afterwards yeah. echoed that. So I thought, okay, I've got to learn something from this. Right. So, so six, seven years later, when you're playing it now again, eighteen, uh, eighteen you said, years later. S- oh, I thought you said seven, between. It was in two thousand and. And the other year was a year and a half ago, so 2017. So, so this last time, a year and a half ago, did you... you, you, you I remembered that. Yeah, so that helped. And that, yeah, that, and I didn't have to resort to anything. Yeah. I, I just remembered that that's a key to it. And people, do people, you know, prefer older actors as Lear? Do you think? Also? Well, yeah, but the I mean, problem, reviewers... problem with Lear is it requires a lot of energy, and it requires a lot of line learning. Right. And actors who are actually old enough for it usually have trouble with both of those things. <laughs> yeah, right. But... Uh, because I've been so obsessed with the line learning thing. Actually, when I did the year and a half ago, it was easier to learn than, um, say, the play I did next door a year ago mm-hmm. was much harder to learn than Lear. Mm-hmm. And certainly Oleana was much harder to learn than Lear. So Mammoth's harder than Shakespeare. Yeah, oh, Because Shakespeare, oh, there's the beat of the pentameter. I see. So that helps to... Yeah, that helps you. But Mamet has a, certainly his own rhythm. But oh it's, yeah, it's but it's it's a deliberately erratic rhythm. It's yeah, it's, right. uh, it's yeah. brilliant writing. It's I mean. it's like you know where uh, I was. Uh, um, yeah, I know. I, uh, me too. And I, you know, I, 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 you know how I'm feeling. And yeah, yeah, I'm there, right there with you. I know. And it's it's just enough to make it. Uh, yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. And this is like dialogue. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you know, it really sinks in. It really is effective, and I don't think anybody could do that other than David Mamet. I, I've never seen it before. Maybe, maybe there's some people that try to copy this type of minimalist and very fragmented. Yeah, he's way very of distinctive. But there are other writers who. The easiest one to learn I've ever acted was Tennessee Williams. You just don't want to say the next word other than the one he's written. Mm. Yeah, I was so lucky when I was a kid. I grew up in New York. And oh, uh, in the seventies, and my parents were member. They they met in art school in New Jersey, and then they, as a young couple, they moved to Queens. Yeah, uh, they they really had a charmed life, and they would they joined the public theater. And in the nineteen seventies, they would drive their Volvo, yeah, with me and my sister into the village, and they'd park, and they'd hope that after the play at the public theater, when they got back to their car, it would still be there. Because oh, yes, right. <laughs> it, the, it was called the Bowery. I remember. Yeah. That. yeah. And so, but I, I, I was dragged into these plays because uh, I would be brought in as a kid. Yeah. And my parents would be seeing Short Eyes and they'd be seeing the David David Hare fil- uh, play. Or, yeah. yeah. Or, or, I mean, I was seeing some of the most amazing actors, maybe even, you know, uh, many people, I'm sure many people you've worked with. And, uh, but I wanted to be anywhere else because <laughs> it was like I was watching. In fact, yeah. your co co actor uh, in My Cousin Vinny, Fred Gwynn, I oh, remember once, and I knew him from the, the TV I show. I did two or three movies with him. Right, because yeah. you're 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 like this. You both were hired often as character actors, yeah. so it was oh, likely that there was a pool character. of characters. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to be as yeah, right. I don't want to uh, Char- step on toes. Uh, oh, character uh, actors is a good thing to be because you don't age out of it. 
But then you would go to the theater, if you're lucky like me, mm -hmm. uh, to live in a city like New York, mm -hmm. and see Fred Gwynn all of a sudden, a star of a play, mm -hmm. or Will Gear, all these guys yeah. that I knew from TV shows, and all of a sudden they're at the, and I'm like, wow, look at them, these guys are fucking amazing. I mean, you wouldn't know from Herman Munster. <laughs> yeah, right. Lowly and, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, it just was a remarkable yeah, experience. Yeah. But, I, of course, when I got old enough, I joined myself, and I got to see a lot of stuff. Yeah. It, it was an amazing time, you know? Oh, it was. It was. It certainly was. Yeah. It still is. It is, right? Yeah. It costs more, though. <laughs> Theater was yes, so inexpensive. Does. I'm a Tony voter. Sometimes I'm a Tony voter. Did you get voter. free tickets? Yeah. So I'm works. on the board of different organizations. But then when I'm not on the board anymore, I, I'm not a Tony voter. <laughs> So I try to make friends with people at the box. I just oh, let that me makes sense. I'm here. And people must be happy to let you in. They are, and sometimes yeah. they're not. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's sold out. <laughs> yeah. You know. The other thing, I guess, of my generation is we grew up on these films. When I was also coming up as a young person, there wasn't this enormous children's movie industry. You know, yeah. you get the occasional Disney movie. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, the crazy... Sh dog that talks to Dean, yeah, Dean right. what was his name, Dean Jones or something. But, uh, you, you know, there wasn't like the industry. And so we went to movies like Barbara Streisand movie or, you know, yeah. we'd go see What's Up Doc or we'd yeah, see right. often movies that were comedies because yeah. they were more children appropriate and you'd yeah. go see it and you would be in these movies. So so for a generation like me, you know, we always knew who who you are. So it was a, it was a genuine um, treat to to invite you and to kind of connect with you and to invite you on and a friend of mine is an actor said oh yeah he 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 uh, teaches at HB she hears his email I'm like oh cr terrific oh good so I'm isn't glad. that nice I'm glad me too me too yeah uh, would you even if your Hollywood career I mean that would have, might have gotten in the way of your doing as many plays and as writing and directing plays and wouldn't it I mean if you were yeah I I. Would that have been okay because of the paychecks? Uh, the mo well, the movies are, are more than just the paycheck. And, of course, the indie films, there isn't much of a paycheck. Right, no, I get it. But, um, but, the, but the paycheck helps because in the theater, you don't ever get paid that much of course. per day of work that, that you do in, in any Hollywood movie. Although that fee has gone way down because I even in Hollywood movies really yeah you get paid if I get paid a fifth of what I got 20 years ago yeah because I haven't been in that many Hollywood I, I, the last hot well two last Hollywood movies I was in was Wall Street 2 where you were Oliver Stone I played a scientist of some kind <laughs> That's funny. And and uh, you didn't have any scenes with Sylvia Miles, huh? You didn't have a, the scene with Sylvia Miles. She was back for Wall Street too. No, they I, brought I, her my back. My scenes were with. Uh, <laughs> were they with? Uh, well, they were. Well, long been... scientific speeches I had, which were very hard to learn because I didn't know what I was talking about. Right. I mean, I. Um, I wonder what what that would have been. I can't remember. Um, and the, uh, um, um, the other one was the Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, most recent Peter Bogdanovich film that was a, technically a Hall um, industry sure. movie, but uh, it was right. Shown. They probably raised money independently for it, though. She's funny that way. She's funny called. that way. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. So those were the two big star movies that I've done in, since. I think since A Beautiful Mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Peter's coming into town. Peter Bogdanovich. Oh. Are you, are you, are you have a good relationship. Oh yeah, I love him. He's coming into town because there's two projects. This guy is all of a sudden also really busy right now because he, there's oh, great. a yeah next uh, for the New York Film Festival. This is why I'm a little run down actually because I was up. Uh, I went to uh, their they had the big opening night festivities last night and I managed to uh, wait outside the box office hoping to you know I got it for friends there yeah so I got into this party and but um, uh, they're showing as part of the New York Film Festival this. Uh, in fact, right now, as we're speaking, it may be going on is us, Orson Welles' uh, the, 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 the Other Side oh, of the Wind. The Other Side of the Wind. Oh, man. I want to see that. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't go to the press screening, and I thought, again, I'm, but I'm going to go to one on one, I think this week, later this week. 
in the afternoon. Yeah, they're yeah. they're showing it. Oh, in. let me know how it is. I will. I'll try to. I maybe I can yeah. try to get you a ticket. But you, you might be busy. But um, uh, maybe I'll be not. Busy. I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll follow up. And okay. then if you're available, we'll see what I can do. Sure. Because maybe they'll give me a plus one or something. Or, oh, you that'd know, be wonderful. You don't have to sit with me. But <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> and also, you know, he has, <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich has a documentary on Buster Keaton. Did you know that? I, I know of it. You oh, know. it's called uh, yeah. The Great Buster, I think. Yeah, right. And it's uh, coming here, too. So they timed it. Probably mm-hmm. not coincidentally that, uh, that he's kind of here to do press for both of those he's things. He's a marvelous director. Some of his flops are as good as other people's hits. Yeah. And his hits are transcendent, you know. The Yellow Laughed was considered a flop, but it, it caught it's, it's on. It's a lovely movie. Yeah. And Re- very you... utterly original. Very much so. You know, and that one called St. Jack. Was oh, my God. Beautiful movie. But yeah, that was shot in the Philippines, wasn't it? Like, was, Singapore, wasn't that place? Or Singapore. Sing, it was in the, it, uh, the Pacific, right? The, like a, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an incredible film. Yeah. Yeah, they just, I don't think people knew, uh, the, the industry knows how to market those types of films very well. And I think that's where also, they suffer. Also, they didn't get good reviews. Well, that's because people. And, and people decided they didn't like Peter. You think it was personal then? Yeah. Which, I mean, A, Why? Peter's likable. Mm-hmm. And B, <laughs> um, this isn't high school. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Film yeah, well, criticism maybe it is. is not high school. Yeah. So you worked with for him twice? With with Peter twice? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or is it more than that? You were in uh, uh, What's Up, Doc? What's Up, Doc? Which was she's your... funny that way. I, did I do anything else? I don't think so. Uh, Would you say he's like your favorite? I guess you can't really say that. Of of the you film directors really, I've worked say with? That. You can't. You oh, can't. There, are, there are 27 of them. Yeah. All your favorite. You can't say uh, that. Yeah, you can. uh, um, that would be fair. Uh, Jonathan uh, Lynn Jonathan yeah, Lynn and um, I thought for a minute what was the guy's name Lynn Baker I was thinking that's who you meant at first the actor oh Mark Lynn Mark Baker. Lynn Baker oh, yeah. but that's not I don't really know him I've slightly known him for years he's, right because he's, he's another theater yes he guy is. He and is. character actor yeah yeah he's very good um, the uh, oh where are they? oh oh, oh uh, Billy Wilder right. He, I love, oh, he is incredible. He had to have been amazing. You did the front page we're referring to. Yeah, was, Alan but, Pakula. I did Starting Over. Oh, you were in Starting Over yeah, with Joe had, Clayberg. Yeah, he had this, ex- and with and Burt Reynolds. Reynolds who, he well, had an extraordinary way of working, Alan Pakula. He would do take after take after take after take after take. Each take he would give you a different choice to play. It wasn't about coverage. It was about no, just I mean, all getting in the different same shot. Was it for the getting something out of the acting? Do you think, or was it so he could or, have choices? Or getting the acting out of something? Oh, he, 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 finally, you were trying so many different things. You didn't know what you were doing anymore, and that's when he liked it. Oh, I see. Because then you're just on instinct, or on, yeah, on chaos. Yeah. Okay. You don't know what you're playing. You're just doing it, mm-hmm. and uh, he was fascinating. And um, um, he was a very interesting man. Mm-hmm. He, I, I learned a lot about acting from being directed by him. Really? Yeah. I, I went up and I auditioned for him. Charlie Durning told me, you got to be in the Pakula film. I'd been in several movies that Charlie was in. And I, Charlie was in Fiddler on the Roof on the Road. And then when we were trying it out, and then his part got cut. But I kept up with him, and I was in several films with him, and we just made the Muppet movie where all our scenes were virtually with each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I called him from the airport to say uh, it was great, and he said, you, when you get to New York, get yourself in the Bakula film. That's the next one I'm going to be in. Mm-hmm. I said, well, okay. So I got an audition. And then Pakula called me back. And he said, I just want to talk. Why do you want to do this part? He said, <laughs> for the job. But, but also, I said, and I meant it, have you ever seen his All the President's Men? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I said to him, <laughs> yeah. that movie has more good performances in it than any movie I've ever seen. That's why I want to be in this movie. Mm-hmm. I want to see how you do it. 
He said, but this isn't the kind of part you usually play. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? He said, this is like a normal human being. <laughs> you play all these crazy In people. In the comedies. Because you, you did a lot of comedies. Uh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and even a, a common theme is the characters are always very eccentric. And all. Sure, this guy right. That's was right. an ordinary guy. I said, well, that too is interesting. Mm -hmm. And so finally he called me back again. And he was going... And then I, I hit on one line reading he really loved. And this is sort of contrary to the, the way he works, but when I couldn't reproduce that line reading in, in one of the scenes, he kept doing it over and over. Mm -hmm. And I finally said, Alan, I, I, I can't. It's gone. Mm -hmm. can't, he said, okay, all right. Um, and the... Um, but that way he worked on the scene I'm talking about, all those takes. Mm -hmm. And every time he'd go, mm -hmm, okay, we have that. Let's try this. And around take 11, you start to go into a panic. I'm never going to please him. He's not unkind at all, but I'm never going to please him. I'm never going to please him. And then, And then you get into this kind of not knowing what you're doing. I have no idea what take he used, mm -hmm. and and um, 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 and then I had, just by accident I had dinner with him and his wife three weeks before he died. I hadn't seen him in a few years, and we had a marvelous long talk. He was going to write a movie about FDR and Eleanor, and he said. I said, who's going to play those parts? And he said, I, 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 I've offered them both to Merrill. <laughs> both, well, that's funny. <laughs> I said, well, that's, not, that's a good idea. And uh, that was her first really great performance, was in his film of Sophie's Choice. I mean, she was awfully good before then, but that was just like, whoa. Yeah, she, I forgot he directed Sophie's Choice. Yeah. And, with Kevin Klein. Yeah. And... Um, uh, she just she and moved Peter. from being brilliant to transcendent yeah. Yeah. in that movie. Yeah, she, and, it was heartbreaking. No oh, performance, God. and yeah, just the immediacy of it, and the and the um, um, and he he um, immediacy was a hallmark of the performances in his movies. He's not usually mentioned uh, in the same pantheon or sentences uh like i can hear that <laughs> you're, you're rubbing um as like when you think of a new york director people talk about Sidney lumet yeah they talk about martin scorsese of course yeah uh brian de palma even my point is is that alan pa 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 pacula pacula is not normally mentioned I in know. that group of, of, of new york directors, even though they're, they're making a documentary about him and they I, are i got interviewed for that oh terrific a lot me along with do you know who's Maryland doing that? Many, many people. That's great to hear. Cause he... And uh, um, the uh, um, that I'm glad they're doing that. Me he, too. He's very undersung. Right, undersung. Yeah. I'm gonna have the film. I'll, I'll see it. I, that's like a, the perfect guest for my show because it's like kind of like a. F f I'm talking about if the filmmaker comes on eventually when the film's finished. Because uh, it's a you, you know a film somebody who's a, a film about filming or filmmaker yeah, or filmmaking right. is like an ideal subject for it. that's why getting Peter Bogdanovich on for, to talk yeah, about yeah uh, Buster Keaton yeah and yeah. Orson Welles is going to yeah, be fantastic totally cannot wait yeah and, and have you I'll, ever read Peter's uh, the book that is uh, a collection of Peter's interviews with Orson Who the Welles? Devil Made It. No, called This Is Orson Welles. Oh, is oh no, I'm sorry. I, I looked not, that I, up. I ordered it. No, I, I'm trying to read, get a, I'm reading one now, which is a collection of his interviews from, with different Hollywood directors. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Howard Hawks. Yeah, yeah. But this is a book and entirely interviews with Orson. Orson, yeah. First time I met Peter was on the set of Catch-22. Peter, wow. we, in the desert of Mexico, Peter would sit there in a black suit interviewing Orson. All the time we weren't on screen. Uh, wow. And uh, um, uh, it very seriously mm -hmm. in Orson Wood. And all those interviews, plus ones he went all over the world doing of Orson, 
are in this one book called yeah. This Is Orson Welles. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I, I just ordered a copy last week. You're going to love it. I can't wait. Yeah. You're going to love it. Because I read a, a Henry Jaglum, well, Henry Jaglum, P- Peter Biskin, who also just did my podcast. Uh, he wrote, oh, he's great. Yeah. He, I'm, I have to, I'm putting that up this week, that conversation, actually. Oh, good. So that one, he edited the book of Henry Jaglum's writings. Yeah. In that one, I believe, though, Orson was very upset because Henry didn't mention that he was recording those conversations. And, and, and Orson really comes off as a, as a windbag. You know, he's like... Oh, he is. He is horrible he is, to, he's, to, he's, to Henry Jaglum. And Henry just keeps sucking up, you know? He's... Uh, Orson was very hard on Mike Nichols during Catch-22. Yeah. But at the same time, he was sort of irresistible. He was Nothing. like a bad boy. Yeah. That's that's what he is. He was a bad boy. Very bad boy. He was? Yeah, he would fuck up takes. I mean, he would... He, he was Intentionally, bad. or are you just saying... Yeah, this? well, he would say, Mike, uh, I don't usually blow lines. Uh, there must be something wrong with the scene. <laughs> I don't think it's anything I'm doing, and I would be the other person in the scene. And Mike was, and and then with a group scene, we would rehearse it, and then we'd sit out there in the in the desert till it was lit, and then we'd go into start just before we shot the scene. Orson would say to Mike in front of the whole cast of the scene and the crew, "You know, we can't shoot this the way you directed it." He said to Mike Nichols, "I don't think you understand about comedy." He said this to Mike Nichols. Well, how do you, and Mike, Mike, was, Mike is the Mike comet, was patient. Com, one and of the most famous very, comedians. Before they knew him as a director, he was known for oh, comedy. He was, he, he, him and Elaine May he, and were, were the biggest thing. director of comedy. But before that, I don't know, he had made uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And The Graduate. And The Graduate. Which had a lot uh, of funny a, stuff in it. Did it? I'm just yeah, kidding. I'm just yeah. kidding. Of course and, it did. And, and of course all the Henry Nichols, wrote it. Nichols and May stuff. And all yeah. the Neil Simon plays he directed breathtakingly well right and i mean it's like orson actually said to him yeah so mike was very patient because mike knew and so orson would redirect the scene and make it less effective wow and then the scenes with me when we would finally get a take Mm -hmm. with me orson alone mike would slip me after we finally got a take he could use um a hershey bar as a reward (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but Pavlov's dog so Orson was imp- A impossible but B mm-hmm. when we would all sit in a circle on those canvas back chairs mm-hmm. while the show was being lit he would be hold court right. and he was you know enchanting uh, he was oh he was so funny and dear and everything but could he be very was he also though genuinely warm guy at times I mean or was he kind of just narcissistic I mean you forgive a lot of this but I'm... he was enchanting I don't okay. know how else to put it yeah. And a lot of narcissistic people are enchanting. Yeah. And after I got back to New York, I began, it was the days of the revival houses, I began to see some of the other films he directed besides Citizen Kane, which mm-hmm. I knew. Right, of course. I thought, oh my God, these are brilliant movies. These are works of art. They're flawed. Mm-hmm. Because he would cut out of town before they were edited. <laughs> but they're, yeah. but they're, they're glorious works. Mm-hmm. I wish I'd seen these before I went down there. Mm-hmm. to Mexico, but you never know. But anyway, that's how I first met Peter Bogdanovich. Yeah. Wow, you, uh, well, the advantage of being the kind of actor that you got, you became and you got cast in for all these parts of the character actors is you worked with, and in the sheer number of films, you just worked, and it was during, of course, this ma- magic time, late 60s to, as, as Peter Biskin puts it, from... Uh, Easy Riders to Raging Bull, right? You're, yeah, that was it started there. before Easy Rider. Yeah, it start, no doubt. It started about the time of Bonnie and Clyde. Mm-hmm. Which is like a year before, maybe. Yeah, a year, maybe. year or two. 67, mm-hmm. Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. That was like yeah, that was the Thunderbolt. Yeah. And then it went. It ended with Heaven's Gate. Mm-hmm. It all came crashing down. Yeah. Which, by the way, is very watchable. So, which is I've, a, I, they show beautiful it at film. the film forum sometimes. Yeah. I've never had time to go see it. It's yeah, because the, the side the good part of a day. To see it. <laughs> but I've always been curious to see it. Mm-hmm. Hold, hold on one second. Sure, sure. Okay. We'll take a slight break here. Well, I should have introduced you. We're talking to Austin Pendleton. <laughs> what time is it? Maybe another. We, we can wind down soon. Yeah, this is just so unbelievable. I guess we'll have to and do. If a, you want another one, I yeah, maybe we'll just do a part two some point. Sure. That'll be nice, because uh, extraordinarily easy to talk to. 
Oh, that's nice of you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that's uh, the one quality I have that, <laughs> you know, that has uh, proven helpful. <laughs> and, and, and also just, like, learning a lot. When I started this thing, I didn't know a lot. I, uh, mean, I kind of really had to catch up. Yeah. You know, and a lot of the people I have on are actually industry people, like uh, not just filmmakers, but the industry side, the business side. So I'll have on a programmer, or producers, or producers, or yeah. or, or distributors. Oh, Distri- wow. Somebody who just like works for a distribution company, or you know, various. Because you're, you know, people that a lot of the people that listen to this are the people in the film industry, and they want to kind of l- know what's going on. So it I can't be it's easy a niche. being a distributor. There's no pattern in terms of what sells tickets and what doesn't. When a thing, well, I mean, I mean, my cousin Vinny's one example of this, but there are hundreds of them. Where who would have thought mm-hmm. it was a, like a, a minor 20th Century Fox release? Right. It even opened like in March or something. Right. And Which was who was the star in it? Really? I mean, you had the guy who plays the Karate Joe Kid. Pesci, yeah, who Joe Pesci. Joe so, Pesci. He just won an Oscar. Well, that's but true. Joe Pesci would have been the star. Actor Oscar and and. And Marissa. Right. Marissa, Marissa Tomei. Yeah. But was and, she a big star then? Huh? Already? Was she already a big star? No. Yeah. That put her on the... That, she got and, and uh, it, she got a, the Oscar for that. Yes, yeah, she got a clever, so she, lovely script. Yeah. And, and, but who, th- who would have thought yeah. it, became, it be, just was a smash? Right. And the pattern of being able to figure... It was always chancy, but now it's, it, there's no way of predicting it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, with these uh, some of these distributors I'm talking about, they're even just working in like with art house films. Yeah, you know, so you're talking about documentaries. But even within that, right uh, framework, right. it's impossible to tell. It's hard, yeah. Or just to get it distributed. <laughs> like, how do you navigate this? You know, there's only so many theaters, and they're closing rapidly too. Um, well, At yes, and there's some new York. ones too. Actually, in New York, there's some new ones. I mean, um, actually, there's been some going up in the last few years, uh, or some expanding. Even Film Forum put an extra screen. Yeah, they yeah. now have a fourth theater. I love Film Forum. Me too. I yeah. just love it there. They have a fourth room now. They they closed I, I for know. the summer I know. to rebuild. Yeah, I know. and um, so and the IFC Center was supposed to add on some extra. They were supposed to have an annex, but I think they lo- the city didn't come through with the money, or the state, whatever it is, didn't come through with the money yet. So they had a screening of Skidoo there in oh, the yeah. spring. So I, I did an interview afterwards. So Where on, at Film Forum? At Film Forum. At one evening, and then there was a Q and A afterwards. So now I'm welcome at Film Forum. I mean, I, I've never been unwelcome, but I, and the um, Otto Preminger movie, which is the first movie I ever made, really, which was catastrophe but then developed this real cult following over the years the skidoo skidoo they're yeah, skidoo yeah, freaks yeah i don't get it mm-hmm. i'm a huge otto preminger fan yeah me too both of him as a person and his his movies mm-hmm. but that one <laughs> well who was somebody had to be high i mean that was the one with uh, Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason, Gleason and, and, and Groucho uh, Marx. Groucho. Nobody's that Mark. good in it, including me. Yeah. And it it's uh, uh, it just they? doesn't work. It's crazy. <laughs> and it's, yet it, the, the, they, a guy once flew across the country to interview me because he was writing a book about Skidoo. Did he write it? Well, I haven't heard of it, mm-hmm. but... Uh, I wonder if it came out. But, I mean, it, it it's like... Uh, they're, it's a cult film. Oh, yeah. People but, just but, love it. That's when you, it helps to see it high. I mean, you in this case, we're to, you know, probably... It'll probably enhance the... I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's... Don't you think? It's about being high, mm-hmm. but it's not... The movie isn't high. It, it It's like clunky. Mm-hmm. I, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, right? Yeah. But what a cast. Yeah. I mean, you know. None of us are at our best, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember, I think I just, they would play that at this, uh, the Alamo Draft House, they would play sequences of it. Mm-hmm. I think it was there or somewhere. They would play sequences of it. I was like, what is this movie? I've never seen it before. How Groucho and two of the funniest people, perhaps, ever are in this movie. And they're not you know, two good. These, not no, and they're funny. Neat, Yeah. How can you do that with Groucho? Yeah, yeah exactly. Do you ever do the uh, Gilbert Gottfried podcast? Did he ever ask you? No. You know Gilbert Gottfried, right? Uh, yeah. Of course, the comedian. No, he I never asked you to do it? I'm no. sure they're going to ask you. One of the guys, Frank, who's the co-host, mm-hmm. he's like this freak of nature. He knows every 
actor. Uh-huh. They're big on the old Paramount monster films and okay. you know horror films. That's one of their real big things. Where where is this? It's a podcast like mine, but oh. it has a much bigger audience. You know, and, and Gilbert should, is the. They, what do they do with these horror? films? They bring on different. No, they. they, they, they it's not about horror films. That's just one of their recurring things that they have a, both that, a mutual obsessive love. About. Yes, yeah, right. and they'll talk about uh, you know Lon Chaney and yeah. Junior and uh, yeah, you know right. all the actors that were in these films and Vincent Vincent Price. Yeah. Around. And they talk about, um, but they have on a different like most of their guests are. Uh, are older people that have been around a long time, you know, totally, so, totally. and so yeah. I'm surprised they haven't reached out to you yeah. just in, you know, terms of uh, your anecdotes and stuff. I mean, it's remarkable. Uh, you, 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 like I said before, you just, uh, I wouldn't even know where to begin with. So you've kind of worked with just about everybody. Not everybody. <laughs> just yeah. about. Yeah. Well, well uh, the, uh, do you, did you end up doing, you did a theater with Meryl Streep, right? Yeah, we were in you Mother did Shakespeare. in Central oh, uh, Park. Mo- not, not Shakespeare, but... Yeah, Brecht. Bertolt, th- yes. It was thrilling. Was it? Oh, it was thrilling. Who else was in that cast? Meryl Streep. Kevin Klein again. Uh-huh. Um, oh, God, lots of great people. Yeah. Jennifer Lewis. Uh, really good people. Yeah. Um, the... Um, and 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 George C. Wolfe directed it, right? Who would later on? I guess it was it later, or is it, he was already the uh, executive or, or the, the uh, director of the public theater. He had been with the, the public artistic for a while, director. But this was Excuse after me. he was at the public. But it was a public theater production. No, no, of course. Oscar, yes. Oscar Eustace hired him for mm-hmm. this. Oh, I see. And I, I loved him. He gave me some of the best direction I've ever had. And George. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. And she's just heaven, Meryl. Yeah. My big scene was with her. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I was every scene I was in, she was in. But mm-hmm. then we had a big scene, which mm-hmm. was like, yeah, air being airborne. Mm-hmm. It was wonderful. Uh, you see, yeah, uh, is she? Would you say one of the? Huh? These are stupid questions. I'm what? getting to. I'm just getting to these uh, points where I'm, I'm asking stupid questions, like, well, you know, like like a fan would ask almost uh, about Meryl Streep and. When I was in high school, this is the last anecdote I'll talk about myself, but I'd like sharing it with you because you seem to really enjoy it. <laughs> when, I, when I was in high school, I was in the theater department. Uh-huh. I was re- re- really into theater, yeah. but more like almost intellectually, so yeah. not as much like the acting itself wasn't you know mm. that big a deal to me, I guess. But I liked the, I liked the being around other people who acted, and I yeah. liked the process, the artistic and intellectual yeah. process. And I had a great theater teacher. She would she she had actually taught also Fran Drescher, who would play oh, the yeah. nanny you yeah. know, on TV. She was there before me a little bit, but she I, I this is a great theater teacher in Queens. And one of our drama teachers ended up having a friend in an off Broadway theater, and they were setting up. They were going to launch a new play, play called Shout Across the River, which is nobody knows about. And Ellen Barkin was in it. She was her first, you know, she was an unknown actor, although yeah. we knew she was going to be a star from this. So she was like, just, yeah. but, but one day I was going in, I was there on the weekend before a play or something. And as I'm walking down the steps, there's, I know on, on the side is the office for the stage manager. Yeah. And you could see into the office through like a little, there was like a little internal window or something yeah. where yeah. I saw the reflection, Meryl Street. And this is in 1980, maybe 1980. And so what has she done? Three movies? Four movies? She did... The Deer Hunter and... The Deer Manhattan. Hunter by then, and maybe Kramer versus Kramer? Cr- yeah, Manhattan, yeah, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I'm seeing in the reflection Meryl Streep breastfeeding a baby. <laughs> that would have Here been I am, I'm about right. 17 yeah. years old, 16 yeah. years old. Yeah. And she turns out it was her, and she was good friends with the stage manager. Yeah. That was my, my Meryl Streep That's story. That's a marvelous story. Just, actually, no, it just, is. It's, it's, just, it's very. But here again, she's you know, very down to earth. Oh, I, I, I you, you just know that. Yeah, yeah from given her, her as one of the biggest, and she just happened to be end up being a big star. Yeah. But it wasn't meant to be. It just happened to be. Yeah, you know. Well, she she's basically a character actress, right? And it was very unusual for that to become like a movie star. Yes. Um, I mean, it's true with Dustin Hoffman too, and yes, right, they, like, and a couple of other guys. And it was not that long. Richard after, Well, it was a few years after he became prominent. But yeah, he was the same kind of. And thing. Richard Dreyfuss is another. You know, yeah, there's some of these guys yeah. who really were 
wasn't supposed to turn out like that, but yeah, they got right. very, very, what is it? I don't know, you know. Thunderbolt Yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they're all just so talented. Sure. You know. Yeah. Um, I better stop right now because I have to meet some. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so let me just thank you and um, for this. And we'll, yeah, we'll down the road. Let's we'll, we'll do part two. I absolutely. Thank you, Austin. This Wonderful. was terrific. And and I do want to hear about the uh, the article you were mentioning because we were talking about uh, Kavanaugh and that whole thing. And then you mentioned you were quoted in an article. You oh, said, about Trump. I'll, I'll tell yeah. you right now. Just after the election, somebody from the New Yorker Bless you. writing an article about what, what are actors' responses to this, okay. or acting teachers. So the guy who wrote the article called here, mm-hmm. and she put me, Edith put me on to him. And so I talked to him on the phone. And he said, what do you think is his appeal? Why, did he, why is, the hell is he elected? I said, he's, he's, he has a thing which good actors have when they're performing. He's in the moment, which most politicians are not. Um, most politicians are, have to think about the consequences of virtually anything they say. Certainly that was true of Hillary, whom I love. I love Hillary. Mm-hmm. I love, uh, politically, I'm with you. I love Bernie even more. But, um, <clears throat> um, and, 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 and Bernie was very indirect in, in the moment as a candidate, but still there was a framework. Trump, people just thought he, whatever he was saying was what he was thinking at that moment. All it was, was sort of all it. It was sort of like unheard of in politics. Right, yeah. So I, I was saying to this guy on the phone, and he was saying, wait, you're talking approvingly of him. I said, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, first of all, I don't know yet. I, I have my doubts about what kind of presidency, but... Let's see. But no, I'm not talking. You're asking me what appealed to people. And he all but got mad at me. That's weird. Because it was a, actually a rather astute question. For I mean, to frame it and, and yeah. to get theater teachers yeah. is really smart way yeah. to go about an article. Exactly. Why and, is he now? And there was something almost shockingly fresh to him to a lot of voters. Mm-hmm. And, and that... Uh, it almost wasn't the quality of what he was thinking. It was the fact that it was actually what he was thinking. Mm-hmm. And, and even in the most off-the-cuff politicians, including like with Bernie Sanders, you certainly don't see. You're, the profession doesn't allow it. Mm-hmm. So the very thing that has made him such a questionable president made him a sort of an, a, a seductive candidate. Mm-hmm. That's what I was trying to say. And oh, he, he quoted me in the article... But he was mad at me on the phone. I said, I'm simply answering your question. <laughs> so anyway, that's that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm.